Welcome to Quilter's Toolbox, a program dedicated to bringing you the latest tools, some great tips, and innovative techniques. Our guest host will share their insights and take us to new levels of sewing and quilting. Here's what you'll find on today's show. Today we will meet Ami Sims from Mallory Press. Ami shows us how to make this jacket. It's an unlined jacket with gobs of overlapping fringe made from quilting weight fabric. The fringe is machine sewn to the jacket base in strips. The strips form a V-shape across the front and back of the body so the wearer looks elegant and slim instead of like a giant piñata. Let's test your knowledge on Quilter's Toolbox with our Quilter's Quiz. Warm and natural is a kind of A, batting, B, fiber fill, C, pillow form, or D, fleece. Find out if you're right later in the show. Finding time to actually quilt is a hard thing. Um, I think I made more quilts before I went professional than since I have become professional in that there are other obligations. There's the writing and the patterning and the teaching and the traveling and, and countless emails, which I love to read because I like to hear from other quilters and see what's going on in their heads too. So finding actually sewing time, actual sewing time, that's the trick. Actually, I was doing a senior individualized project for an undergraduate degree in anthropology at Kalamazoo College, which sounds really like, how did I get there? But I was doing participant observation with an old order Amish family in northern Indiana. And I wanted to be very agreeable. And when they suggested, well, would you like to learn how to quilt? I said, mm, sure, sounds good. So I wound up at a quilting bee. And there I saw about a dozen old order Amish women sitting around this large trampoline. And they were stitching on the trampoline. And then I noticed it was a quilt spread out in this big, huge floor frame. And they were quilting up a storm. And they asked if I would like to do that too and wanting to be agreeable I said well sure because the idea was if I was agreeable enough and pleasant enough maybe they would invite me to live with them for six months so I could learn what it meant to be Amish by studying their culture firsthand well that very first day um, I made stitches that I now refer to as foot hookers you've heard of a toe hooker that's the stitch that is so large if you ever put that quilt on a bed conceivably you could get your toe hook through it this is a foot hooker. We're talking big stitches. And after I left, my Amish friend Ida put her arm around my shoulder and she said, Ami, you know that day you quilted with us? After you left, we pulled out all your stitches. Uh, I don't know what they did about the blood because I wasn't wearing a thimble, but um, bled on both top and bottom of the quilt and made huge, enormous stitches. Oh, I still love to quilt. Um, the blur between my real life and my professional life as a quilter is, is totally that, a blur. It's very hard to stop one and, and begin the other. So I'm constantly looking for quilt patterns. I'm always petting fabric. I can't get my mind off of quilts. So that's my occupation, my avocation, my hallucination. It's everything. Oh, my poor family. I live with uh, my husband and my daughter and my mom and uh, a dog named Madison, who if I don't say anything, I'm sure he'll get angry. It's a, a boy dog with a girly name. It's not my fault, I'm sorry. Um, and I live in a padded house. I have quilts hung on the walls, draped over banisters, folded up in places. Those are the decorated ones that are supposed to be there. Then I have my luggage that's usually never unpacked until the next trip, and there are quilts layered everywhere. So they, they put up with quite a bit. Oh, make quilts. Absolutely. One right after the other. And you don't have to finish the first one before you start the second or third or fourth. I give you permission to have unfinished objects orbiting however close you want to have them orbit, or when you're finished learning from them, chuck them. I'm Ami Sims. Ami, in case you've never heard of this name, rhymes with salami, but I'll answer to any lunch meat. I'm going to show you how to make the rag fur jacket pattern today. And it's the one I'm wearing. Uh, and I'm surrounded by rag fur people. 
all over the place. This is a great fun project to make because you're going to get tons of compliments whenever you wear this garment. It's a great garment to travel in because you can take it literally, wad it all up, put it in your suitcase, undo it, and you don't un have to iron it. In fact, you can't iron it. There's no human way possible to iron it. It's very lightweight. It's basically a jacket base with bias fringe sewn all over it. And um, I've also called this pattern Michigan Mink. And sewing hours and hours on the fringe, I've also called it sewing on the lunatic fringe. Uh, I was wearing this green jacket over here, and a gentleman came up to me and said, uh, do you change colors in the fall? Well, that's um, one thing you might want to consider is the fabric choice. That's a very green jacket. It sort of looks like a bush jacket. Um, I could sort of crouch down and be a bush for a while if I wanted to do that. When you select your fabric, keep that in mind. What colors look good on you? What colors do you want to showcase? And what colors are available? The kind of fabric you want to select for the rag fur jacket is a fabric that has color on both sides. Here are some fabrics that I used for the jacket that I'm wearing. And I have the, bag, the base fabric here on the inside, and this is a beautiful Hoffman of California Fabrics um, hand paint bally fabric. And I also have more Hoffman fabrics here that I used to create the fringe. And I try to basically pull colors from the base fabric. Anything that appeared here was good enough to go in this pile of fabrics that would later be turned into the fringe. Now as I go through these fabrics, you'll notice that there's color on both sides and it's equally intense. Also, this fabric is luscious. It's a very tightly woven cloth. It's got a very high thread count. Not only does it look good, but it's going to last forever. So it's a good idea to get fabrics that will last forever because you're going to put a lot of time into this jacket. The fabrics are fringed, and it's an interesting process. They have to be cut on the bias so that they last. And the best way to do that is to take a yard of fabric, or maybe a little bit more than a yard, and fold it diagonally until you have about eight layers. This is what I've done here, and I'm opening it up to show you. This is a fairly large chunk of fabric folded eight times, and you want to fold it as carefully as you can. The resulting strips will be bias cuts. I'm going to move some of the fabric samples off to the side, and I want to show you how you'll begin your cuts. The first thing you'll need is a nice long ruler, and these Omni Grips are wonderful for this because they're not going to slide very much. And I'm going to take and first trim off of this side. And you'll notice that I'm using my left hand. I'm going to suggest that you make this first cut with your left hand, which might be referred to as your stupid hand if you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, just flip this whole thing around. But the first trim takes off some excess, which we don't need. And then the next thing we're going to do is cut strips. And the strips are going to be cut with our smart hand and the same ruler. Alrighty, here we go. Now you have to move your ruler just up a little bit to get the rest of the cut here. Close your blade for safety and we've got our strip ready to fringe. The fringing is going to take a little bit more time than you'd think, but it's lots of fun. Research shows that jean and denim were two very different fabrics in 19th century America. They also differed in how they were used. In 1849, a New York clothing manufacturer advertised top coats and short jackets in chestnut, olive, black, white, and blue jean. Workers like mechanics and painters wore overalls and trousers made of blue denim. Denim seemed to have been reserved for work clothes when both durability and comfort were needed. All right, we've got our bias strip. The next thing to do is to fringe it. And this is way fun. You'll be spending hours doing this. First thing you want to do is whack off the little points where you have all the uneven fabric. Just take it right off of there. And I'm using um, some really keen scissors because they are springy. And as soon as I make my cut, they spring back for more. This makes life a lot easier. I've tried it with conventional scissors and you don't want to go there. It takes forever. This is cutting through eight layers of very tightly woven fabric and these scissors are doing a dream job. Now you'll notice that the strip I'm cutting is a little bit different than the strips I'm wearing. That's because I am 
just preparing a strip just cause. If you want to see what your jacket is going to look like, what you can do is take all the fringe that you've cut up, mix it like a little bit of spaghetti, and you can see it's going to look just like this in jacket form. Now, what I also want to show you is it's an important thing to keep these layers stacked. After you cut this entire layer, it's a great idea to keep it stacked because if you don't, it will be a mess. And I would fringe the entire thing when I get to this end. I'll whack off this part too, which is really not needed. Now, after you've got the fringe and you've stacked it in a place carefully so that you will keep it all intact, it's time to take and sew it onto the jacket base. Now, the jacket base I've got in front of me has been prepared with lines that are marked about an inch apart. And I do that with a marking instrument such as this Aquarelle pencil that I know will come out when I'm done. That's important. Also, keep this baby sharp. The sharper you get the pencil, the thinner the line, the less line you have to wash out when you're all done. And I'm lining things up with a straight edge. I use my ruler and once the initial mark has been taken off the pattern, it's just a matter of making one inch increments. You'll see at the seam right here on the sleeve that there is a little angle change right at the seam and that's important. When you start layering your fringe, you will sew up until that seam, cut the fringe, layer at a slight angle. That way you have a little bit of something here underneath when this spreads apart. And that will happen. The more you wash it, the more poofier it gets. So that's one of the things that you're banking on is to have this thing sort of explode with color. Now this fabric is this jacket right over here. This is what it's going to look like when it's finished. And here I am with the strips. You'll see exactly what it looks like once you have your strips cut make them a little bit of a spaghetti pattern there and you can see what your jacket will look like. When you're working with an overall fabric such as this hand paint by Hoffman, it's not necessary to audition each piece. Trust me, take it as it comes out of the pile, sew it down. You couldn't line up two pieces of fabric exactly the same way anyway even if you wanted to. What you will do is line them up on the line and you'll sew with about an eighth of an inch seam right along here. And you're going to be guiding the sewing machine as close to that raw edge as you can get and still hang on to it, about an eighth of an inch. These are staggered so that the next seam will be sewn a half inch away. So every other time you get a line to line up with. Once on the line, once in the space between the lines, then on the line, then in the space between the lines. And everything should line up all right. Now if you want to sew fast, that's fine. If you want to go 90, that's okay. If you want to take one eye and look out the window while you're sewing, eh, maybe not a good idea. But you can do very fast sewing because it's not necessary that you get lined up exactly on the lines. Anywhere close is good enough. No one is ever going to notice if your sewing was a little bit like this. Trust me, they won't care. Now, when you place the bias on here, these bias strips, because they are biased, nature of the beast is that they're very stretchy. What you want to avoid is overstretching it. And you can see how this is going to stretch as I pull it just a little bit. The best thing to do is to just lay it on there as carefully as you can without stressing that edge. And as you sew, you'll find that this will curve and snake and move around on you. That's all right as long as you're always going to be sewing about an eighth of an inch from that raw edge and you're not pulling this as you sew, it will work out just fine. So if I was going to sew this piece, I would stop, take my little scissors here, cut that, and then I would lay the next strip right on top, overlapping probably by about a quarter of an inch. Here we are sewing along this after we've overlapped it, and as you come to the edge you may think, oh, we got some stuff hanging off. That's all right. This can be trimmed away, and this is also usable, this very little piece. In fact, when you think about it, you will have cut strips off a giant triangle, and the very point of the triangle will give you very short strips, almost two or three inches. That's okay. In fact, that's sort of built into it, because as you work your way around the jacket, here I am working at the bottom. I've sewn my strips. Look how tiny that one is. So these small strips are equally valuable. Use those up first. Those are at the top of the pile anyway. 
and you can build your jacket filling in all the spaces. That's important so that none of the base fabric will be showing. Then your next and final step is to take your garment, finish it up, sew the underarm seams, pop it in the washing machine, throw it in the dryer, and let it explode. It's way fun. Have a good time with it. Now let's go back in time with QTV's Rewind. Today we go back to 1994. The project today, we're going to take these strips, and they were all cut two inches wide before they were sewn together. And they're sewn together, as I said, from dark to light. Uh, the way we're going to cut them for the program today is, first of all, of course, we need to straighten our strips. And we'll do that by putting a line on the ruler right on a seam line. And trim the ends of the strip. Now, if you're right-handed, you might want to turn your strip over. And the pieces we're going to cut are two inches wide. Remember, the strips were two inches wide, and now the cut pieces are two inches wide, so that we, it looks like when we're finished that we have a row of squares. Now, in order to cut it square or to cut it straight, again, I need one of the cross lines on the ruler right on the seam line. And the two inch line on the ruler is on the cut edge. And these are the pieces that we need. Now we're going to start our design with our very center strip. And let's take a look at what we have. You know the pieces we already cut. Let me just bring two of them over. These are the pieces that we cut from our strips. And they are going to form most of our design. Let's take a look here at our very center. It starts with the pink. It goes to the green, then it comes back to the pink, and, from, and then in the very center we have a special kind of a strip that we're going to be working on. And then down at the bottom it repeats the pink, the green, and the pink. And I have chosen to have my darkest color at the top and at the bottom so that that's the one that forms the design against the background. All right, let me get my center strip. As I told you here at the top, we have these three pieces sewn together. This is the one combination from the pink, from the green, and from the pink. Then if we take a look at it here, this is a little bit different. We need to cut a piece for that and for the green that goes down from it because it's not made from these pieces. So let's go and take a look how we're going to cut those particular pieces. Let's start with the green first. For the very center strip, we need to cut and sew together these fabrics. And what we have here are our first five, and then we repeat it from the center. So we can't use these pieces that we've already cut because we have this piece to add onto it. And I have found that it's just easier to sew these nine pieces together. So once again, we went from the darkest to the very lightest and then back out to the darkest and these were all cut two inches, and when our strips are cut, this is the piece we get. And that's the piece we need for our center. Okay, so let's go up and put that in place, and that would go right here. And then the bottom is just a re reverse of the top, so we'll just work down until we get our center piece done. In other words, this piece is just turned around down at the bottom. How did you do on the quilter's quiz? If you said that warm and natural is a kind of batting, you're right. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Cheryl Wiederspan from Homestead Specialties Pattern Company. I have a quick tip for you today using um, a common ordinary closure that you may not appreciate the full value of. It's hook and eye tape. Hook and eye tape are hooks and eyes pre-sewn to a band. The, um, the white hook and eye tape is actually dyeable, and we're going to quickly dunk that in a cup of strong tea and pull it out at the end so that you can see an easy way to color and customize your own hook and eye tape. Um, before zippers, hooks and eyes were the most popular closure in America for both men and women's garments, and our grandmothers used hooks and eyes. And then the zipper was introduced in the 1916 to 1920, and it was actually a row of hooks and eyes operated by a slider, and that was the forerunner of the zipper. But now, this is a trim that has uh, come back into vogue and come of age and is popular again. You may find it in a velvet ribbon. You may find it in different colors or a satin ribbon. You may find large hooks and eyes on a satin ribbon, and you may want to experiment with a cousin of hook and eye tape, snap tape. Uh, this, these are two ready-made garments, inexpensive ready-made garments that I trimmed with hook and eye tape to show you some uh, tips that you might do and some uh, decorating ideas. This is just the eye tape, not the hook tape, just the eye half of the hook and eye tape. And I sewed it to a ready-made garment and then laced the ribbons through the eyes to give it a laced up effect. Sort of a, a corset inspired sort of look. The other shirt that I have uses both the hooks and the eyes, and they started out white, but I dyed them to match the shirt and edged it with a little narrow ribbon. Gives a nice vertical line down the shirt, which you know is a flattering placement, and gives just a little bit of interest and uh, pizzazz to an otherwise very plain top. Let's see how our uh, hook and eye tape is doing. Look, we have a wonderful tan color. And that's how easy it is with dye or tea or coffee to customize your own hook and eye tape. But my very favorite way to use hook and eye tape is to make totally detachable garment units like the sleeves I have on. These sleeves are attached with hook and eye tape. This is the eye tape on the sleeve extension and the hooks are under my sleeve. My shirt tails are also totally detachable because of the same hook and eye tape. And this hook and eye tape has been dyed to match as well. So my shirt tails can come off. I can wear the shirt short or long. This is Cheryl Wiederspan. I hope you've enjoyed today's tip and enjoy garments with multiple wearing options. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of these jackets. Remember the one that I'm wearing has lots of different fabrics all matching the inside which is my pull fabric. This is the one that I went for when I was selecting fabrics. Some of these other jackets though are made with just a single kind of fabric. This jacket in particular came from this Bali hand print by Hoffman California Fabrics and you'll see that it changes a little bit once it's fringed. What I find so interesting is the original fabric and the inside of the jacket is a little bit lighter than when the fringes appear. And I like that contrast. It looks a little bit different. Here's another one. This one was also made with the Bally hand prints. And this one reminds me of Easter. Looks like painted Easter eggs. This was made by my friend Sharon Thomas for us. And this one also has a little bit slightly different view, a uh, little bit more shading where there's a little shadow behind these little fringes that pop out. And it really doesn't matter what fabric you select, as long as you get a very tightly woven fabric in a color that pleases you, where the color goes all the way through from the right side to the wrong side of the fabric. The tighter the weave, the better, and you'll have loads of fun putting this jacket together and enjoying all the compliments you'll get when you wear it. This is one of the most packable garments. It's a fun thing to wear, and I think people will enjoy it. If you would like a copy of today's Quilters Toolbox program or would like to order today's feature project, call 
1-800-248-5293. That's 1-800-248-5293. Or visit us on the web at quiltingtools.com. Please remember to specify the program number when ordering. Thank you so much for joining us on Quilter's Toolbox. We hope you learned something new or just had a good time. We sure had fun bringing you this show. Please join us for the next Quilter's Toolbox, where we'll bring you the latest tools, some great tips, innovative techniques, and some good old-fashioned quilting fun. <laughs>